So today we're going to talk about a new citizenship that we have that changes everything. Now, before I press into this passage, it's going to be uh, Philippians 3. We just saw the text there. You can turn in your Bible uh, to Philippians 3. Those of you who are perhaps watching online, grab your Bible always. Again, the text for this course, for this class, we're always looking at the Word of God. Before I, I jump into this, you know, the Scripture tells us uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we are to honor those who serve as leaders among us. Because it says they work hard and they, they care for us in our spiritual lives and they guide us to, to the Lord uh, all the time. So we're to honor those who, who serve us. And uh, praise God, you all do this well as a church family. But I wanted to pause for a moment because today happens to be Stephen Carroll's birthday. And I wanted us to just celebrate him. Stephen, we love you. We praise God for your life, how you point us to Jesus every week. We thank you for all that you do. We Praise God for you. We honor you. Love you. What a joy it is to serve with my brother Stephen. Uh, we've been together almost 10 years. I've been here 11 years last month, in fact. And uh, I think the past year and a half was about 10 years, I think, added to our, to our lives. But it has been wild. Hey, just recently, um, a couple weeks ago, I lost my license, my driver's license. Um, yeah, I didn't know who I was for, for a while. I had no ID. I had, and immediately I thought, oh no, I'm supposed to go, just a few days later, I'm supposed to go to Nashville. How can I travel? Much less ride, you know, like drive my car. And I didn't know what to do. Then I remembered, ah, if all else fails, I, I've got a passport. And so I know that my passport will get me anywhere, right? Passport has my, uh, has my picture in it, proves who I am. Uh, it tells you wh where I'm a citizen, where I'm from, who my people are. It has a surname, tells you who my tribe is, right? Where I belong, has my address, when I was born, all those good things. And, and it even tells you where I've been a bit, right? But to be an American going around the world, not just a national, but traveled the world as I have, uh, it tells you not only my identity, it tells you uh, where my loyalties lie. It tells you a bit about who I am, what I what I believe in, what, what, I, what I honor, and what I value. Things like personal freedom and hard work as Americans. We value time. We value equality. We value uh, personal freedom and personal responsibility. All those things. Democracy, all the good things. Independence. All the things we, we celebrate. To know that I am from the United States of America, it says right here, it tells you something about me. Uh, you, can, you can tell who I am. It also tells you where I've been, people I've met along the way, perhaps what shaped and formed my life, you could say, people that have met around the globe. But I was thinking, okay, good. At least I have my passport. Passport reveals my identity, my loyalty, and my destination, ultimately, where I'm heading, you see. There have been times when I've been traveling around the world, coming back from Gosh, uh, before pandemic, coming back from Africa with a group, uh, we were from Qatar, long trip, all the way back to DFW. And there have been times I've, I've gone to Japan or to the Middle East or to, I've been to the most Southern Baptist church on the planet, by the way, literally, South tip of South, Amer uh, South Africa. And I have been, uh, I mean, around the world, long flights. And there have been more times than not when I've come on these long flights, and you've experienced this perhaps if you've traveled much, um, will land on American soil and the whole plane will erupt into applause. Like, yes, we're back where we belong. Because often we'll find ourselves in other parts of the world and realize I, I don't belong here. I'm not in Kansas anymore. And that's how that happens a lot. If you've not traveled, you may not know that, but the Bible tells us that we have, those of us who've been born from above, have been dropped back into this world where we now live, we don't belong here. We have a new citizenship. And this is what Paul is going to show us here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 uh, through 21. So I did make it to Nashville. I made it there for um, a, a retreat. Uh, it was an event, about 120 or so, 150 young leaders from across the nation. Um, I mean, young, like Gen Z leaders, young millennials were there from all over the nation who were in ministry. They were artists. They were all kinds of different uh, influencers, if you will. 
I was asked to be there, not to be, not because I'm a young leader, but because I was asked to come and really talk to these young leaders about what it is to be in him. You, you see us talk a lot about this. It's what this book really is all about. Paul talking about what it is to be in Christ. I want to know him. I'm covered in his righteousness. I'm totally loved. I'm completely forgiven by him. I have a new identity, right? And so I was asked to come, Jeff, talk to these young leaders about what that means, where identity is found, and then how to stay in it for the long haul. How do you do this? How can you be in ministry like this for decades, right? I was at a seminary not too long ago. I say that before the pandemic, so a couple years ago. And I was in the professor's office afterwards. And he said, we need to have you come back. And I spoke to the, to, the, to the seminarians there, the students. He said, you need to come back because our students, they need to hear from happy pastors. Wow. Implying there aren't that many, evidently. And it has been clearly a difficult season. That was pre-pandemic. But what I want to say to you today is that I, I'm a happy pastor. And it's not unlike a marriage. I'm happily married because I love my wife and she loves me well. And I know I joined Steve and others of us, our whole staff. We've gone through some hard times. And I just want to pause today and just say thank you to tell you that I love you as your pastor. And we praise God for you. And we're in this together. And Paul tells us here, he, he says, we have a new citizenship and together all we want to do is know Christ, pursue him above all else. This is what he's talking about early in this passage. He has a new ambition today, a new citizenship. And the first thing I want you to see here, we have a new identity together. Look at what he says in verse 17, join together. I'm, I'm going to read from the NIV, join together. We're better together in following my example, he says, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Now, I don't know if you could say this. Follow me. Do what I do. It's in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus. The very first sermon that I preached here from this spot as your pastor some 11 years ago, that was part of my text. All I have wanted to do is to say, hey, I'm gonna follow Jesus first above all else. And as I do, I hope that you can follow me. Now, can you say that? You know, are there certain areas of your life where you're like, I don't want anybody to follow me in this case? I mean, there've been times I've shared this with our staff. I think there's a lot that, you, that I could emulate. I mean, you could look at me and say, do this, do this, do this. Follow me as I follow Jesus. I've often said at times, my, the pace of my life at times, don't, don't follow that. Don't follow that. And that's not simply a confession that I work so hard. That is, that's a confession of sin. When we're so busy in the work of God that it kills the work of God in us. This past week, I want you to rejoice with me, Grant Glover, who serves our, our college students, our young adults. They launched a new ministry. He's been working on it for a long time with a team called Off the Clock. It's a gathering for young, uh, really, again, Gen Z, college age, young adults to come together on a Tuesday night. And they were over off, they were at the Angelica off of uh, 75. If you know where Mockingbird Station is, they're gathering there on Tuesday nights to say, come, these are disconnected. They're reaching out to their friends who don't have a church home or don't maybe know the Savior. And they're wrestling so much of this generation, deconstructing their faith all the way to the point of denouncing their faith. And they're, they're inviting their friends to come. They had some 80 to 100 young adults to launch this event. And very few of them connected to our church and many to no church. And I say that because when they win, we win. That's what I saw in this group of young leaders in, in Nashville. They didn't look alike. Very diverse. People all different colors. And in this group from different denominations. And they, they were united in Christ. And it's obvious because they don't look alike. And this is the goal and vision of our church. 
Our hope is that everyone is welcome here and we can prove that we're not united simply because we all look the same. John Wesley was the one who said, hey, we may not think alike, but can't we love alike? I love that. This is what the world needs today, that we're in this together. And Paul says, you've got a new identity because we are in a new family. This new identity shows that you are in a new family. Brothers and sisters, we're all in this together. And so this new identity then means that I'm in Christ, right? I'm in him. Now, again, many people are deconstructing their faith. And there's just this this sense. I've talked to so many who are, are still, all of us in varying degrees, still processing our faith. Who am I truly in Christ? I think the more that he reveals his love to us, as we've sung about today, the more we're in his word, the spirit reminds us and continues to form us and shape us into his image. This is a process of sanctification. These are three aspects of your salvation. Justification, being justified before a holy God because of Christ, being sanctified, becoming like Christ. This is what this whole book really is about. And then ultimately we'll land here today being glorified, to become like him when we see him face to face, when we find ourselves in heaven before him, we will be transformed. This whole process of becoming like him will be made complete. He who began a good work in you, Paul says in this letter, will be faithful to complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. So here's the thing. We encounter one another in process, right? We need to remember this. We're always in progress. We only encounter each other in progress. And I say that because, again, nowadays I'm, I'm discovering a lot of people who are just frustrated. Uh, some have called it post-traumatic, what we've experienced. To process our grief and all that we've lost and loved ones who we've lost and others who, who've lost jobs and so many people are at a place, I don't know if you can, re- I think you can relate to this, we're just tired. And now as things ramp back up, we're trusting and hoping. Many are saying, I just don't think I can get back to it. I read an article in the uh, Harvard Business, Re- Business Review that, that, that was entitled The Great Resignation. Of people who are resigning from their work, not going back to work. I don't want to get back into that. I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm going to work from home. I'm going to, I'm going to change jobs. And this is happening almost at an, at an epidemic kind of rate. And I've discovered that many of us, it's, it's kind of in our, in the water these days. A lot of people just, I'm just kind of tired. We're seeing it in, in, in the church world. Who's here? Who's not here? Pastors across the nation and friends who I'm talking to, it's, It's a crazy time. And I'm saying all this to encourage you today because many people are deconstructing their faith to the point of denouncing their faith. Some of you might be old enough to remember 1976, long time ago, a cover article on Newsweek magazine, the year of the evangelical, it said. The evangelical, relative, relatively new term, not in theological circles, but in America because Jimmy Carter had just won the election that fall and, and the Gallup pollsters noted, they're the ones who coined the phrase, there was a large group of people called evangelicals who voted for him because during the campaign, if you're old enough to remember this, he, he, he said that he was a born again Christian. Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher in Georgia. And I say that because many have said, if that was the year of the evangelical, some say that 2021 is the year of the exvangelical. Those who are denouncing their faith supposedly were formerly evangelicals and no longer claim to be some 30, 35 million Americans. Now I say all this and you're thinking, wow, Jeff, you're just a bowl of optimism today. Um, I'm saying this because the reality that we face Friends, listen, this is what we're made for. This is what the church is made for. Moments like this when we say we've got the answer. And yes, help one another. Those who you know and your family and others process their faith. Many are talking about how they've been hurt by the church. There's a lot of talk of those who've been hurt. And many have been hurt by individuals, by Christians 
neither the church, I mean, we need to help process that. Some who say, I've given up on church. Don't give up on Jesus. We need to help. See, doubt and deconstruction is actually an invitation into community. Doubt is a part of faith. In fact, I could argue that doubt is proof that you have faith. It's like the guy who is an atheist, who's angry at God, right? We doubt because we struggle and we want to be drawn closer and closer to him, but we can help one another. Now, here's the truth. Some of us have claimed we've been hurt by the church when in actuality, no, you didn't get hurt by the church or that individual. That was your pride that got in the way. It was your preference. It's what you wanted. That's different. We need to process all of this. De good deconstruction takes place when we measure everything up against his word. Whatever doesn't match Jesus that we maybe always have believed, we've got to throw it out. If it doesn't match up with scripture, doesn't match up with him, we need to toss it, denounce that. But if it does, we've got to hold on to it. We don't throw it all out. And I'm speaking to some of us here. Maybe you know some who are kind of processing their faith like this. Don't let your deconstruction become a denouncing of your faith. We're all in this together. It's important to remember that. And we're all in process. So, so I want to encourage us today. We're all, yes, discovering anew this identity we have in Christ. Paul says, I know one thing. He helps us understand how to deconstruct, if you will, pursue one thing, Christ. He is the prize. He says one thing, and then he says, no, actually, there's two things. Forget what lies behind. Yes, process your past. Forget your past. Move on into the future after you have processed it well. We're all in progress. And we need to love one another in that way. Some of you know, I, I went to Ruth Graham's um, tombstone where she's buried there in Charlotte, now beside Billy Graham. And I don't know if you've seen her tombstone, but her tombstone says, says, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. Isn't that beautiful? And it's made me think, we all probably would do well to just encounter one another that way or wear a sign that says, I'm under construction. Please be patient with me. And friends, if you're a guest, and many of you are today, we're seeing a lot of first time guests with us every week. This is a safe place to process. This is a safe place to bring our doubts and, and to wrestle with our faith together. It's an invitation to his word, invitation to him. So we have a new identity. Let's get it right together as we grow together. And then secondly, we have a new loyalty. We have a new loyalty. You know, my passport, again, reminds you, tells you I'm an American. It says the United States of America. Look at what it says in verse 18. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. So here's their destination. They're heading towards destruction, a life eternal without God. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, many years ago, I, I found myself in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I found out only later that there were signs posted in places like London, New York City, other major airports, don't go to Lagos. Like, don't go there. When I got there, I encountered a group of, of soldiers, all in green military uniforms with, with, with guns. They take me into a, a curtained off area, me and about five of them. And I, I was all alone and they were just asking all kinds of questions, just trying to make it real difficult for me, trying to, trying to intimidate me. They wanted money in the end. I didn't give them any money. They finally let me go. I ended up at Joss, Nigeria, a small kind of town there. Um, and, and it was the most, it was the craziest place I've ever been in my life. If it weren't for a, a missionary across from customs there, I would have never made it through. It was wild, chaotic. I say all that because I've been to places 
where there are those who clearly are enemies of the cross. In Africa, I've encountered extreme Muslims. Uh, In India, we've encountered uh, extreme Hindus. I've seen witch doctors in places like Venezuela, South and Central America. I realize when we go away from where we belong, right? You realize, wow, this is not home. And we start to see when you take the gospel, when you take the light out of certain places, it gets really dark. It's tangible. And I say that because what Paul is saying here is often enemies of the cross are not as easily identified. And we often want to label certain ones. He says these are among us with tears, he's saying. These are people who might be among us. And he he gives us three descriptors. They're indulgent. Okay, this is their God is their belly. Whatever feels good, they're all about it. Their glory is their shame. They no longer know what's right and wrong. What they claim as evil is actually righteousness. And what they claim as righteous, though they wouldn't call it that, is actually evil. And then finally he says they're set on earthly things. Their focus is in the here and now. They want it now, whatever it is. Because they have no sense of eternity. And Paul gives us a contrast here. And Jesus tells us that we are to be, we often say it this way, in the world but not of the world. That's not what Jesus said. See, not of the world is not the destination. That's the starting point. Jesus said, you're not of this world. You're a citizen of heaven now. New identity, new loyalty to me. Now you're sent into the world. We're not of this world, but we're sent into the world. And friends, what drives all of this? New identity, new loyalty, and finally a new destination. We are heaven bound friends. Look at verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Friend, you and I are heaven bound. This is where all of history is heading. And in the meantime, he's calling us to bring heaven to earth. That's what the incarnation is all about. That was Jesus' great prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So until we make it there, the calling is placed on our lives is for us to live in him, this new identity. And friends, be encouraged today. Remain loyal to him. Don't give up. Continue to press on toward the prize. Because there's coming a day when we will see him face to face and we will be transformed to be like him. Henry Nouwen put it this way. Wondering how things will be for me after I die seems for the most part a distraction. When my clear goal is eternal life, that life must be reachable right now where I am. Because eternal life is life in God and with God. And God is where I am here and now. Friends, we talk about this often. Yes, he's the God of the past. Yes, he's the God of the future. But he's not there and he's not there. He's right here, present with us. This week, every moment, remember this. As you're heaven bound, God is in the moment. Focus and live in his presence right now, right here. Jesus says, dwell in me as I dwell in you. It is this divine indwelling that is eternal life. We don't have it apart from him. It is the active presence of God at the center of my living. The movement of God's spirit within us that gives us eternal life. So here's the bottom line. If we ask Jesus to manifest his joy in us, in the here and now, that our joy may be full in him. He's promised us in John 16, 24, that he will do just that. Ask and he, he says, I will make your joy full. My joy will be complete in you. Friends, you have a new citizenship in him. If you have received his grace, you have a new loyalty. Stay true to him. Obey him. Stay in the game. Don't give up. And invite others to join you as we head into this new destination where we're all heading when we get to heaven together 
glorified before him. So what does this look like? He says, well, you need to follow some models in your life. You need people who are actually living this out. And today we thought it'd be wonderful just to pause and to stop and reflect on a model who is among us. My dear friend, some of you know, John Parker. I want you to watch this. I'm a lifelong member of the church. In fact, I'm proud to say that we've had five generations of our family as members here at Park Cities. This is our church home and our family. My name is John Parker, and my wife Zona and I have been married for 51 years. We have three children, Meredith, Catherine, and John, and uh, four grandchildren. It seems like that uh, health issues have always been a part of our family. It uh, really came into focus about 15 years ago um, when in August of 2006, uh, our grand twins, Ellie and Jack, uh, were born two months premature with a genetic disorder. It's a rare form of muscular dystrophy and it's called myotonic dystrophy. They stayed in the hospital six months and uh, soon after they were born, we nearly lost Meredith to a massive blood clot. Uh, as we did further genetic testing in our family, we realized that Meredith, John, and I all had the same genetic disorder, just to varying degrees. September of 2006, my wife Zona had the first of many uh, major surgeries over the ensuing years. Uh, after many years of uh, suffering and uh, hospitalizations, uh, our daughter Catherine in 2014 passed away from MS. Due to the degenerative effects of myotonic dystrophy, our son John has become disabled and now lives with us. And over the past couple of years, I personally have been dealing with cancer and pulmonary fibrosis. If I was going to make it through these trials and difficult times, I knew I was gonna to have to rely on God more than ever before to receive his peace, comfort, and strength that he promises. Instead of being overwhelmed by my difficulties and uh, worldly concerns, I needed to have a view of God's perspective, eternal perspective, uh, with the, knowing that the citizenship of earth is only temporary and that my citizenship in heaven as a believer is secure. Knowing that helped me to uh, try and live above my circumstances and praise Him. While I was a citizen of earth, my duty to Him was to try and live in a Christ-like manner in response to these trials, sharing the gospel, loving others, and serving those in need. To those of you who perhaps are going through difficult times or will be at some point, I would like to encourage you to continue to draw closer to God and to surround yourself with family and friends to support you during those times. I'm not sure how we would have made it through our difficult struggles without the family, friends, and our church to love and support us and especially to pray for us. I think that even during all the trials and difficulties that not only my family, but I've had personally, I've still tried to remember that God gave us his greatest gift in his son, Jesus Christ. And he was willing to do that for me, even knowing that I was a sinner. And to me, that gives me such great joy to know that he's not only willing to redeem my life, but he's willing to redeem the circumstances of my life and things that, uh, as it says in Romans 8, 28, that I know all things work together for good who know the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So I know that he does have a plan for my life. He is control. And so I don't have to be worried and concerned about that. And so that's really where I get the source of my joy because I know that God is going to redeem all of these things. Thank you.